Okay, I'd like to open the meeting for the City Council on February the 13th, 2012. We'll open with the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask that you turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. If you're going to speak today, uh, you would receive five minutes to speak. We'll tell you when there's one minute left in your time. And we'll start this morning with the mayor's, or this afternoon, the mayor's award of excellence. Mayor Beidler, please. Afternoon to you all. This is the mayor's award for excellence for January. And it's being presented to Jeff Yanda. Uh, who is a Star Tram bus operator with the Public Works Department, and he's worked for the city since December of 2009. Coworker Tony Kent nominated Jeff in the category of Valor for his quick action on December 11th of uh, last year to help a bus patron needing medical attention. Jeff noticed a man who had boarded the bus who had uh, was having difficulties with respect to running his boarding pass through the fare box, and Jeff checked out if he was feeling all right, and he collapsed right there in the front of the bus onto the steps and fell onto the sidewalk and began to have a seizure. Mm -hmm. Jeff immediately called the dispatcher and requested medical assistance, uh, got uh, fire and rescue immediately on its way. Uh, after about 20 seconds, the seizure ended, and Jeff uh, confirmed that the man did have a pulse for 911. While waiting, Jeff placed the unconscious and unresponsive man on the sidewalk and laid him on his side. After one or two minutes, the man regained consciousness but became combative. Uh, but Jeff was able to keep him calm until uh, medical help arrived shortly thereafter. He helped fire and rescue assess the man's condition and remained with the passenger until he was transported to the hospital. Jeff has no medical training, but he said it was just made sense to do what he did. Tony said Jeff went above and beyond his duty to take these supportive and potentially life-saving uh, actions. So it's my great pleasure to present Jeff Yanda with the Mayor's Award of Excellence for January. Please join me in congratulating Jeff for his hard work and commitment to the city of Lincoln. Jeff, come on up here. Uh, I accept this reward on uh, behalf of all city workers and Star Tran bus operators that go above and beyond the call of duty every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mickey, do you want to say something there? Sure. Or both you are both welcome to. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Weston. I'm the operations superintendent of Star Tran. Jeff's a great example of the type of folks we have at Star Train, and we're all very proud of him. Um, Mickey Esposito, Director of Public Works, and I, I think this is just exemplary of uh, folks at Public Works who go above and beyond. So I'm really proud of you, Jeff, and Thank proud you. to have you part of our team. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Jim. Okay, under the public hearing consent agenda today, we have items one through six. I wanted to briefly mention that we do have a miscellaneous referral that was not published. It's simply noting that we received two change of zone applications, 05004A and 12002, and that those will go on to the planning department for scheduling uh, before planning commission. Uh, if anyone wishes to address an item on the consent agenda, you may do so at this time. Anyone yes. wishing to speak to the consent agenda? I see no one. Okay. okay. Under public hearing liquor resolutions, I'll call two items together, seven and eight, the application of a Cena Corporation DBA South Street liquor for a Class D liquor license at 1000 South Street and the manager application. Would you please raise your right hand? 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you believe it to be? Yes. Would you state your name and address? Manuel A M A N U E L. Last name Tella T E D L A. South Street, 1000 South Street, Clifford Street. Do we have any questions, Mr. Telda? Uh, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> we don't have any. Okay. Well, thank you for your appearing today. We appreciate uh, thank it. You. Thank you very much. Right. Anyone else wishing to speak to these two items? Okay. Okay. Under public hearing ordinances, second reading, item nine, approving a lease agreement between the City of Lincoln and Awards Unlimited Two for the lease of a portion of a vacate and vacant city-owned lot generally located at 20th and N Streets for a four-year, four-month term with the option to renew for an additional two-month term. Item nine. It's coming. Uh, members of the council, David Landis. Um, Urban Development Department and the moving party in this case. This is an attempt to respond to the needs of a local business that we um, have a positive relationship and who is bearing the responsibility of having their existing parking lot um, inconvenienced as we replace a sewer line. We have both a temporary easement for the purposes of construction and a permanent easement for the placement of that sewer line. And it runs in this corner, this area of the awards unlimited property, which will make that unavailable for parking um, as we do that construction. Uh, we've paid for the temporary uh, easement and we've paid for the permanent one. And when I say we, that's actually uh, a, a Java expense. It's not a city expense, it's uh, from the Java uh, project. However, um, awards unlimited came back and said, gosh, You've got some city property down here. We'd like to rent it. Um, and we agreed that the price would be $400 a month. Um, they would also improve it with crushed rock and they would maintain weeds during that time. And they would also give them a two month option if they needed to extend it and that they could not sublet without our approval. Um, we think it's a good way of reaching out to a business that we are inconveniencing. No, we're certainly paying for that inconvenience, but we want their business to succeed during those four months, and this is a way to do that. Other questions? Questions from Mr. Landis? I see none. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Thank you. Items 10 and 11 will be called together. Approving the development and conditional zoning agreement between Nebraska Nurseries and the City of Lincoln to assure that direct access to Pioneers Boulevard will be relinquished and that a public access easement will be granted should the property generally located at South 80th Street and Pioneers Boulevard be rezoned to 02 Suburban Office District. Item 11 is change of zone 11043, application of Nebraska Nurseries for a change of zone from R3 to 02 Suburban Office District on property generally located southwest of the intersection of South 80th and Pioneers Boulevard. Do we have the applicant present? Yeah. Good afternoon, Tim Gurrigan with Olson Associates representing the applicant in this rezoning case. Um, we met with the city staff a planning department to work out the best case scenario to uh, be able to have a 5,000 square foot dental office placed at this corner. Um, we agree with the conditions prepared by staff. Um, we agree that's in the best interest for the community and for this user. Uh, we have overwhelmingly gained support through planning commission with an 8-0 vote and we have uh, actually sent a letter to the neighborhood association last month to the president uh, and our reply back to their, uh, uh, for, from them was that they supported our uh, application. Um, the condition for the trip through, if I may put up a, a site plan. The property we're looking at is, is this property here at the corner of 80th and Pioneers. Uh, part of the conditions we have uh, put, agreed with the city staff is to locate our access to this lot in the south half of the property. As you can see, there is a 
a substandard median brake at this current location. I believe it was installed uh, by this user for their curb cut access here. It is actually, with the tree growth in the median and the proximity to pioneers, it is not a very safe median brake. That is why we're agreeing to put our access point more closer to the south end of the block so that patrons using the dental office can turn and make an appropriate U-turn at this median break here and then get back on the Pioneers. Uh, in accordance with the new access policy that's coming forward for, uh, for you today as well, is we're agreeing to also provide access to this lot as well, assuming that that lot further develops into commercial, that this access off of Pioneers will be uh, rel relinquished and its access then would be taking access through our property and making this access on the Pioneers, which is a, a lot more safer movement uh, than having driveways on the arterial. Could you center that and zoom in just on the lots that you're talking about? The zoom button's there on the side, on the, the, on the, fa on the face of it, probably underneath your sheet, I suspect. There you go. Go a little bit, just a little bit more. There you go, and then center it up. A little bit more towards the, so the west is showing a little bit more the other way, the other way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the dental office um, will have no weekend hours. It's um, eight to five operation. Um, it does, will have to go through the architectural review committee, uh, just like all the other houses at the neighborhood. It will have to be built to the same architectural covenants as the rest of the neighborhood with a pitched roof, certain style of stone and, and uh, uh, colors are on the building. Um, the, uh, um, let's see. I think as we talk through with planning of what the uh, uh, property could be used for, um, right now it is zoned R3 with the possibility of having apartments in there. Um, it could be built into an 18-plex, three-story tall uh, apartment user. Um, we thought that the overall use between uh, like an 18-plex apartment versus a uh, um, dental office probably may be uh, a better use for the neighborhood. Um, the hours, we'll have no weekend hours. Um, you'll have very little traffic that'll want to ever go through the neighborhood. It'll be uh, in and out uh, traffic as you come in, enter in the, into the property and back out. Um, uh, again, um, the users would be there d during the time that's during the normal work hours and no hours during the evenings. Um, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time, Gene. Could you clarify, on the third lot over to the west, there's a small lot in the back. Is that a out lot, that little narrow? This, this one here? Well, you have a, there's two. Oh, those this two, one right here? Yes. Is that an out lot? That is an out lot. Who, do you know who owns that? I believe that's the Preserve Association owns that. Okay. All right. Questions for Tim? Jonathan? Well, who all have you met with? You said you sent a letter, but have you met with any of the neighbors? To present this we did not we went to the president of the association he presented it to the association the president told us they had no comment back and so we did not meet with the uh, uh, neighborhood okay Diana. well that was basically going to be my question too is if you had met with the neighborhood because frankly we have had some concerns raised by some of the neighbors sure yeah we definitely would not have ever want to get to this point and not have to address the neighbor comments uh, during planning commission we had uh, a few discussions with a few of the neighbors um, and had resolved that uh, issue we thought with that case but um, we definitely would have made a formal presentation to the neighborhood but after presenting the the information to the neighborhood Appro uh, association president we did not get anything in return of anyone having a comment on the project so we move forward without that neighborhood meeting tim can you talk about the the zoning to the to the west is b b4 uh b2 marvin do you know if it's b2 i believe it's b2 b2 yeah b2 uh, and that's that's in um there's a use permit well maybe marv can speak to it there's a use permit for that so you'll have office on the east side and B2 on the west side of that one residential lot. 
That's right. I just want to clarify that there is a residential lot in between the B2 and the proposed O2 at the corner. It's R3 today. It's a residential lot, but um, that owner in, in previous informal discussions has indicated that he feels the long-term use of that lot is a, a higher and better use. And so uh, we, we would expect that at some point in the future there would be either a continuation of the B2 zoning to the west there or or an office use possibly. But it, it's, today it is R3 residential, but we're trying to plan for the eventuality of redevelopment. And the intent would be on that center lot that that access onto Pioneers would go away based upon the the easement across the south part of the lot. That's right, that that, that, that would give that property, now residential lot, the opportunity to go either to the east um, and, and out to 80th Street or to the west to the, to the drives because there are a series of access easements across the front of those lots and out to uh, a, a right turn only drive and then finally to Lucille. Okay, and then the yacht lot owned by association is, and I think we put that in there back well, when we did the, uh, the use permit because the townhomes wanted a buffer between them two. Is that correct? I, I, I believe that's right. Yeah, I think it was planted when the commercial came in. Yeah. So there's a, there is a buffer there of trees and berms and things, I think, that was required when we the use permit for the B2. I think that's right. That's okay. right. That is correct. Yeah. Carl. Uh, Marvin, the, the large lot to the south of this and then the next lot to it, why, what's that zoned? What is, um, that it's part of the community unit plan. Um, it's zoned R3, it's, but it's part of the community unit plan for residential uses. And um, it is owned by the Grand Lodge, which is the property across the street. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it permits multifamily uses and it might someday accommodate assisted living or something of the same kind of intensity. Okay. Jonathan. Well, about this access, uh, this residential lot then would have access across the dental office lot to 80th. C correct. Do you see that road connecting further east, possibly becoming then a, a frontage road of sorts between 80th and Lucille further. for those who are doing any kind of business in west. this? West. I mean west. Oh, west, sorry. West, uh, it, it very west well coast. could be. I mean, we've, some of the comments we've received are, have concern about a connection all the way across, that that would mm -hmm. create considerable back and forth traffic for those who are trying to get, you know, from any commercial use along there to one of the inns in order to access Pioneers. And I don't know if you can... I, you know, I, um, I cannot speak to future development, how that may develop out, but um, it is, I think, as we talk about the access policy management on the arterials, we true try to create interconnectivity amongst the similar uses before they go out to the arterials and, and make the intersection on arterials the least amount as possible through there. You now, granted, we do have a, a median break here that would create the U-turn, and so possibly, you know, these two lot connections would be the most mm. desirable at that point, and not further connect to the west. Okay. Any other questions for Tim? Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak to these two items? Please come forward. My name is Larry File. I live at 7820 Viburnum Drive. I'd like to speak to uh, the two items on the agenda. Included in the request to rezone this lot is permission to establish an easement somewhere on the south half of that lot, and we've heard that. The request of this easement has two objectives, and uh, we are opposed to both of those. One is an immediate, one is longer term. The immediate objection is to let traffic enter and exit the lot from South 80th. It's a right in, right out access. That's my understanding. Uh, 
The problem with traffic exiting onto South 80th is how to return to Pioneers Boulevard. It is my understanding, and we have just heard, that a driver in this situation would have two primary alternatives to return to Pioneers. So the first involves the driver making a U-turn on 80th, as was just pointed out, at the first available median break. There are problems with this alternative, one of which is that the median break referenced is directly across from the main entrance to and exit from the Grand Lodge. There are many senior citizens who live there who continue to drive. The other is that traffic moving north on 80th and the traffic exiting the Grand Lodge would have very limited time to react to a driver trying to make a U-turn and vice versa. We're not used to a lot of U-turns in this city at this time. The second alternative for someone leaving this lot and exiting onto 80th would be to continue to move southward along South 80th to the roundabout in a primarily residential district. The second alternative would add considerable traffic to South 80th, and that is in the heart of the preserve. It's lined with single family residences, some containing small active children. As I mentioned, the second objection is a long-term one There is a single family residence, what you've just discussed, to the south of Pioneers Boulevard next to the lot that may be rezoned. It's the only residential lot south of Pioneers between Lucille and South 80th. At some point, this lot is going to be sold and turned into commercial property. When this happens, traffic will be allowed to move across the entire stretch from Lucille to South 80th because I believe it will all be interconnected as are most shopping areas. When this happens, this will exacerbate the comments that I made about traffic on South 80th, the Grand Lodge, the turnabout, the residential area, and small children. A couple other points. Uh, another person and I did appear before the Planning Commission and we did speak to the representative uh, from Olson. Uh, we did not come to any... One minute. Okay, thank you. We did not come to uh, any kind of agreement. We were just seeking information. The association is not controlled by the residents in the association yet because the the developer still owns many lots and has voting control. They are also the ones that are seeking this change in zone. So I doubt if they would object to something that they're seeking. I have no other comments. I would be happy to address any questions. Questions, for Mr. Fowler? Jonathan? Well, just uh, I, because of the concern about access to pioneers, there would be a longer term interest in eliminating the driveway to that residential lot to the west of this lot that's before us today. And yet you're concerned about what kind of access these, or what kind of extra traffic it will bring to 80th Street. There's a median cut there now. What are your thoughts on the location of, if, if they had a median cut in 80th and could just exit on to 80th and go to Pioneers without making a U-turn, without going to the traffic circle? Do you have any preference there, or is that? I think that uh, this issue requires some uh, more time to get the people involved that are actually affected. I noticed when the uh, notice went out about changing of zoning, it wasn't addressed to anybody that lived on 80th Street. It was addressed to some uh, homeowners associations on the north side of Pioneers. I don't know why that was, but uh, that was kind of interesting. So you're not necessarily opposed outright. You, we want to sit down and have a discussion to see if something could be worked. I think so. I don't think we gain by saying, you know, we're firm and solid in this, and they're saying 
that doesn't get us anywhere. Okay. We need to resolve this to the best interest of uh, everybody that we possibly can. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. File, did you sign in? Anyone else wishing to speak to these two items? Please come forward. You can go to this microphone, too. Uh, members of the council, my name is Dave Peaster. I live on uh, 80th and, and Preserve Lane, which is on the traffic circle that you've been discussing. Uh, I uh, am here to ask your consideration of opposing or postponing a decision on this matter so that the neighbors can get together with the proposer, the proponents, and, and work out something. The concern is principally the easement and the road uh, that would connect eventually connect or possibly eventually connect uh, the shopping center on Lucille and Pioneers with South 80th and that's the uh, the crux I think of our opposition and if that could be worked out with some assurances that that would never be connected it might be that we could uh, join together in some sort of proposal or compromise uh, I wrote you a letter uh, are there any questions any questions Mr. Peaster I don't see any. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward. John? Yeah, Mr. Peaster, or Judge Peaster, if uh, there were a delay, do you have an idea of what time frame that we could put this on hold that would give you and the uh, developers and all an opportunity to discuss the matter? As long as we know who to meet with, I think we could meet fairly soon. Okay. Any other? Comments on number on these two items, 10 and 11? Do we have any staff questions? Oh. Uh, members of the council, I'm Todd Stark, and um, I currently am under contract to purchase the property that we're talking about. And um, the main thing that I want to let you know is that um, we're more than happy to grant the neighborhood the ability not to put that easement there. We um, were making that accommodation for the city. And so if, if that's something that they would be um, willing to take out, we'd be happy to do that as well. And um, so we're more than happy to work with the neighborhood in any way we need to. Carl. Thanks for being here. Uh, so you're, are you the dentist? No, okay. my wife is a dentist. Okay, all right. Uh, tell us a little bit about the practice. How many people typically she would see in an hour? Yeah, it, it varies, but, um, you know, we, we um, you know, it just depends. So there's probably, you know, 10 to 15, you know, patients in an hour, I would say. Um, and like Tim was saying, we are... Last patient is normally seen at 4 o'clock or 4.30, depending on whether it's our summer hours or we typically um, close sooner. Uh, we also um, don't work full five days in a week, so um, typically um, Friday afternoons are, we're not open. So I think from a perspective of, you know, traffic flow to the, to the, the neighborhood, I think that they wouldn't really see a huge impact, and especially since there's an easy way to get out. So, did, did you talk to the uh, property owner to the west, immediate to the west, about this? Not me personally, um, but we did uh, talk to him about um, what we're doing. Because initially, initially, and Tim could probably speak to this, I think there was some question as to whether or not how to get this commercial zone changed because it needed to be contig contiguous. And so we, were, we originally were talking to him about potentially having him change his zoning now as well so that it could all be laid out for the future. Um, but I don't think he wanted to do that at this point, so we moved forward on a different path. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please, Anyone else wishes to Please sign in for me, sir. Please. Oh. Yeah. Any other people want to speak to these two items? Do we have any staff questions? John? I, I don't know who would be appropriate on staff, but I just have a quick question on... Uh, uh, the comment was made that the easement would be granted for the benefit of the city and I don't know, Mr. Bartles or Randy, Mr. Hoskins. Just again, again, just go over the city's reasons for wanting that easement and why uh, if the uh, neighbors and the new property owner can agree otherwise, 
where that puts you. Okay. Um, Randy Hoskins, Assistant City Engineer. Um, I guess what I would say is probably the prime reason we want to see, want to see that access easement again is is to create a means for that property immediately to the west to not have to have a driveway out onto Pioneers Boulevard. Um, if you think about it, when we put Pioneers in out there, we kind of we kind of shoehorn that into a to a narrower right away than what we would normally use, and so. Um, there's no room out there to put in, say, a turn lane or something if, if we get something in there beside that. So being able to provide access to anything out there off the side street um, so they're not out there in the, in the fast-moving traffic, that, that helps things out a lot. Um, I, I guess I'm not quite sure what the opposition is to creating a, a so-called frontage road across the entire distance there from 80th to Lucille. Um, Typically, traffic would, it's, it, number one, it's not going to be a nice wide um, drive across there where, you know, it will encourage a lot of traffic because it's going right through the middle of parking lots. And so um, I think someone ha would have to be pretty intentional about wanting to get through there. The thing that I can see is not, not that people would be using that from west to east to get over to 80th Street, but I could see more people using it going from east to west to get over to Lucille to be able to access the traffic signal at Lucille and uh, Pioneers. So um, from that standpoint, I think creating a continuous um, access through there is actually a good thing um, to help traffic movement into and out of this area. Do you have, oh, sorry. if I may just a follow up, do you have any thoughts or responses to the neighbors who express their concerns about having that increased traffic that would get over to South 80th and possibly up uh, to the south there at the uh, roundabout? Yeah, I, I think that would probably be, be pretty minimal in nature how many folks would actually do that. Um, that is a, a fair distance out of the way to, to actually go all the way south down to the to the traffic circle and then back around to get to Lucille, or, um, which is where I assume they would be going. Um, well, then they'd leave them going across doing a U-turn at the Grand Lodge, opposite the Grand Lodge entrance, and I know that there was testimony on that. The, uh, yeah, the street out there, 80th Street, is, is fairly wide. Um, you've got two 22-foot 20, lanes, basically, with an 18-foot median in between them. So. That would allow for uh, U-turns to be made fairly easily. Um, I would not expect traffic speeds to be that high on 80th Street, particularly as you heard it is a residential neighborhood. So you would hope, um, you know, most of that is, is local traffic, hopefully not speeding too much through their neighborhood. So um, making those U-turns should be fairly safe. Jonathan. Um, do you see 80th and Pioneers having a traffic signal at some point? I would not anticipate that it would um, because you've got very limited, um, actually a limited number of homes there that would be um, providing traffic to that point to try and meet the warrants for a traffic signal. Mm. Um, I was trying to recall, I think, does that, does that cross? It, it's a four way. Okay. Um, and so, and it's at about the quarter mile point, not exactly. Yeah, it's but, close. It's so close. It's, it's not like that's it's not a, an, an unusual place for a light, just that in this case you think there may not be enough traffic to warrant. Right. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, vacant land to the north, really, to provide a lot more traffic that would ultimately um, create the warrants out there for a signal. So. You can't rule it out. Could Correct. happen someday Correct. there. Correct. Okay. And... Um, and you mentioned the, okay, uh, uh, 80th Street itself is a private road? To the south, yeah. I believe that is correct, yes. And so we don't really have anything to say about the medians and where their brakes are, anything else, or do we have some say even though it's a private road, or is that their, their deal? I would say that is their deal. I, I don't know that we would, um, number one, it being a local street, typically those do not even have medians, so that was primarily put in there by the developer for the, I guess, in improvement mm -hmm. to the to the looks of the development. So if they wanted to make breaks in different locations to adjust for some other plan, that'd just be a choice they could they could make. Uh, unless unless we felt they were creating some sort of a safety problem or something that would impact pioneers, probably would be the only way that we would get involved in that. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Randy? Thank you. Tim, you have any 
response? Or? Kind of speaking on uh, Todd's behalf a little bit on the postponement, uh, this zone change is a very lengthy process, as you know. Um, uh, we've worked well with the, the time to work with city staff. Um, um, you know, the we do agree with Todd that we can uh, relinquish the access break further or create, make sure that the city at that uh, parcel of land does um, develop to the west, that it only includes those two properties as well and doesn't expand any further to the west to ex uh, expect more traffic. But a postponement on this part um, uh, would probably put Todd and uh, his business out to where we may have to look for other pieces of land we may find where we have to um, um, out of our uh, due diligence period on the property. Um, just to say that we don't meet next week, so we're off two weeks. Two weeks. And do you think you'll be able to discuss with the neighborhood during that two week period in case there's, oh, you definitely. could come to an accommodation? Yeah, you bet. All right. Oh, that, I was just going to suggest how, how, lo how long of a window are you talking about here? Because it seems to me the neighborhood said they would be willing to meet soon yes, on this. We can meet this week, definitely. And so if, we, if, if you could do that and then it could come back up two weeks from now, would that be too much of a delay for you? No, I, th I think that would be fine. Um, I think we'd want to have someone from Marvin's department there or Public Works as well uh, since this is a city condition, not necessarily uh, something that we desire on, on the property. Right. I think that could be done probably. Yeah. I'm sure the city staff can put something together. And like I said, we've got a two-week window where you can have an opportunity to make changes and before we even vote on it. So I think that we can go to John. Well, and it, so if you have these meetings, if you could keep us apprised. Most definitely. Um, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. I, I assume we might want to then consider keeping open the public hearing when we, and, yeah. and the vote for when two we weeks. Yeah. yeah. Anything else for Tim? All right. Thank you very much. Next ones. All items 12 and 13 together. Change of zone 11047, application of city, city impact for a change of zone from I-1 industrial to R-4 residential on property at North 33rd and Apple Streets. And item 13, special permit 1133, application of city impact for a neighborhood support services facility on property at North 33rd and Overland Trail. And just for the public's <laughs> notice, I have a conflict of interest on both 12 and 13, so I'll just uh, run the meeting and not get involved in the discussion, so go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Gus Ponstingle with MAPCO, and I am here on behalf of City Impact and City Impact Homes, LLC. I'm excited to present our proposal today. This project will consist of two primary components. The first is called City Impact Homes, LLC, and that will consist of six new duplexes and two new single-family homes for a total of 14 affordable units. That is located here. It's the yellow units here and the, uh, the two additional duplexes there and a single family there. The second component is called City Impact and consists of a recreational and educational programs for the neighborhood. That will take place in this building here, the red facility. In order to do this, we have amended the existing CUP to add nine new residential lots and a 45 stall parking lot on the north side of Overland Trail. That would be this part here. Can you could you yeah. zoom zoom back on that oh, just a little bit so you can sorry. see? There you go. There you go. Thank you. And um, we will also modify the existing residential lots nine through fourteen into four. There's currently five there. We're going to go to four, and we're going to modify lots twenty three through thirty four. It would be these on the existing plat, which are residential currently. Uh, to, an exist, to keep the existing building and to expand it to the east and west and add a single, re single family residential lot on the west side of the building. That would be right there. So there's, there's going to be expansion on that existing building. Today we are requesting the special permit to allow the neighborhood support services building within the existing CUP and those functions would occur in that building there. I'll give you a little background on that. This neighborhood support, support services building will house city impact. City Impact intends to use the building for social, educational, health, and other related support services for persons residing in nearby neighborhoods. The building will be remodeled and expanded. The building is crucial for, the, for expanding the number of children and families that City Impact reaches by expanding the number of days they are reached. It will also help reshape Peter Pan Park, making it safer for adults and children, 
And finally, it is vital for City Impact staff whose current office is very small and cramped. City Impact will transfer its existing services from their current location to the new building. They don't anticipate an increase in the number of guests per night, but they do expect to increase the total number of guests by increasing the number of nights they are open. We are showing an expansion of approximately 9,300 square feet to the existing building. Parks and Rec's department has also agreed to a 10-foot building restriction easement along the common property line that will allow windows along the south facade of the existing building. And that is right along the south facade. Currently, that existing building is sitting ba basically on the property line. And in order, to, in order to meet the code, they would need to do that. And finally, we are requesting a change of zone for the land between Overland Trail and Apple Street that it be changed from I-1 to R-4 to allow the residential lots. And that is this area right up here. That is currently I-1. So in summary, we believe this is an excellent addition to the city of Lincoln. We believe the residential uses and the city impact services are just the right thing for the neighborhood. The city of Lincoln's planning department has recommended approval of this project, and we have the support of neighbors that we have contacted or have heard from. We appreciate your time and consideration, and if you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Questions? I don't see any. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to these two items? My name is Brad Bryan. I'm the executive director and founder of City Impact, and just wanted to uh, let you know we are very excited uh, about the future of this uh, site for the, for the children and the families in the community. And uh, we've been uh, renting facilities for the last 15 years, uh, different uh, places in the neighborhood. But we're excited that this could be a future home to see uh, urban youth and families uh, developed from the inside out. We really want to uh, walk alongside these children and families, build relationships, and see their strengths and their assets. We want them to be the leaders in our urban communities. And we really see this facility, uh, this housing development, uh, stabilizing that and bringing leadership to our community. Uh, when you see the future model here of, of what would happen uh, to this facility, uh, we'd take the existing warehouse that is there and uh, create a beautiful new home uh, where kids in the, in the community can come after school, uh, come in the evenings for uh, leadership training classes uh, where we're developing their strengths and assets. And we see this just being a, a tremendous asset. We want to see the park totally revitalized as well, working with uh, Parks and Rec. We want to partner with NeighborWorks to see uh, uh, rental uh, classes going on in our facility, as well as the housing uh, uh, neighbors uh, being able to use our facility for community events, uh, family uh, gatherings, uh, reunions, and just really see the community come together uh, to see leaders developed and this area of our city uh, transformed. So any questions you might have? Questions for Brett? I don't see any. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to these two items? Staff questions? Okay, Joan. Item 14, change of zone 1146, application of Geely Investments for a change of zone from I-1 Industrial to AG Agricultural District on property generally located at North 134th Street and O Street. It's Michael Geely, 5320 Woodsview. Um, we're asking for the zoning change um, for the potential uh, new homeowner to be able to get a financing through the banks. The banks won't finance a house with industrial. Okay. Any questions on this item? I don't see any questions for you. Thank you for being here today. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Okay. Joe. Items 15, 16, and 17, amending Chapter 1475 of the Code relating to dri driveway approaches and curves by amending the section to amend the definition of regulations to meet guidelines and regulations under the City of Lincoln Access Management Policy to provide that before a permit for a driveway approach may be denied, the building official or public works official shall indicate the standards or requirements that prevent approval of the permit application to provide for the submission of a request for deviation by the applicant, adding a new section to provide the process for appealing the decision of the building official or public works decision on a requested deviation.
Education and adding a new section to provide the process for appealing the decision for access on a state or federal controlled route. Item 16 is adopting the City of Lincoln Access Management Policy to replace existing driveway design standards. And item 17 is miscellaneous 11007, amending the City of Lincoln Design Standards to repeal Chapter 4.00 Driveway Design Standards to allow for the adoption of the City's Access Management Policy and amending Section 1 of Chapter 1 and repealing Section 2.34 of the Chapter 1 to clarify the necessity of repealing Chapter Good afternoon. I'm Rick Hoppe, Mayor Byler's Chief of Staff. Just want to take a moment and give you just a little background on how this issue ended up before you today. As you know, access management is a tool that we use to make sure that driveways and other access points to a property are safe and don't unnecessarily impede traffic flow. Uh, it really is a balancing act if you look at it between ensuring that we're protecting economic growth and viability that are associated with access and still taking care of those issues of concern in terms of traffic flow and, uh, and those type of things. Uh, when Mayor Byler took office in 2007, uh, he came to see that disputes on access were, were the number one thing he was running into between City Hall and developers in terms of some of the conflict that was arising out in the, in the community. Um, I think there was a feeling, or at least a perception, that uh, the City and Public Works had too much discretion in these policies and that we needed to make sure there was a clear, concise standard in place uh, that everyone could follow. And Mayor Beitler strongly believes that having that clear written standard is the best means of ensuring that accountability, that consistency, and reducing these kind of conflicts. We also want to address a weakness in what we consider our city service uh, to various folks trying to invest in our community. Uh, many developers come to the city and say, hey, I want to see your access management manual or policy. And ours is not written down in one convenient place. Uh, this has the, the, the effect of slowing the process, complicating negotiations. And with a new access management manual, we think will end some of those issues and allow us to hand that over and allow people to move about their business a little bit more quickly. Uh, most importantly, I think the thing that we wanted to get done was to give a roadmap, a very clear roadmap on how you as a person making an investment get to yes. The easiest way to get to yes is having that written set of standards that if you follow, we're going to say yes. Now, I want to emphasize that's not the only way to yes. And the manual recognizes that in the built environment, um, there are conditions that make it a little more difficult to follow these standards. And there are several references in the manual to that particular issue. Um, while we want to give you the quickest way to yes, we also want to give alternative means to yes, and we think the uh, access manual does that. We decided that the best way to develop this manual was in conjunction with the very people who are out there, who are the experts in making these projects happen. Uh, Fred Hoke of our Development Services Center brought together a number of private sector experts. Uh, they were instrumental in the creation of this manual, and we're very grateful that they were willing to lend us their time and expertise uh, in, in taking this forward. You're going to hear more about that process from Fred in just a moment. So these are the reasons the mayor is asking for your consideration of this access management uh, tool, this policy manual, as we move forward on, on, on how we're going to solve the issue of property access. I just want to make clear the one thing this um, really is not about. Um, sometimes access to property is confused with road design standards. Uh, they certainly are related, and road design standards certainly are an important topic if our debate over Old Cheney told us anything. But really, they're tangentially related, and that isn't really the crux of what we're trying to share with you today in terms of the access manual policy. So uh, you're going to be hearing from Fred Hoke next on the process to develop this. Our assistant city engineer, Randy Hoskins, is going to talk a little bit about the elements of the manual and its impact. I noticed in the back of the room that Tom Houston and Peter Catt, a couple of private sector members of our committee, are here to talk about their experiences and, and input here. And finally, uh, we're going to have Margaret Blatchford of the city attorney's office wrap up and give you some indication of the, of the legislative changes that need to occur for this access uh, management manual to take effect. So if we can turn to Fred, uh, we'll get the show going. Council members, my name is Fred Hoke, uh, Director of Building and Safety, and I have a, a packet of information for you that will help uh, facilitate the time here to go through this. I just wanted to give you an idea of the amount of time and the amount of effort that went into putting this together and the numbers of people who have been involved in it. 
about a year ago tomorrow, actually, the, uh, a rough draft of the uh, policy manual went up to the city attorney's office. And then a copy went to uh, NDOR on March 1st and a draft copy on the web on March 14th. On page three of the packet that I gave you is a, a copy of our, what was called uh, Randy Hoskins Roadshow. And what we did, uh, what Randy had, di uh, had done there is on these dates uh, met with these different individuals because we wanted to be sure that everyone who had a stake in this policy or potential policy would have had an opportunity to see a program that Randy put together, which was a PowerPoint presentation that talks about uh, all of the aspects of the access management uh, uh, policy. In mid-May, um, I'm sorry, June 1st, on page one of the policy which I uh, handed out to you, or the uh, packet that I handed to you, we had on June 21st an internal committee meeting, and the people at the top are listed there. And what we wanted to do is to see how we can make sure that we've got the breadth of, of uh, individuals who need to be involved in and aware of this whole policy. So that was the meeting back in June. And then on August 24, which is 23rd, which is on your page four, we had the first meeting of the access management uh, study team. And it lists for you all of the individuals who are on there. We wanted to be sure that we had all four associations uh, referenced, that uh, we had some members at large, uh, an attorney and a road design engineer from uh, the NDOR, and then our city staff involved in that. If you look at the next page, you'll see after we had our first meeting with that group, what we really wanted to do was to list all of the areas where there was some disagreement about this policy manual, questions about it, what, it, what its purpose was, how it was gonna work and operate. We felt that we really needed from the, the individuals that we had at that meeting, what we wanted to do was be sure everyone had an opportunity to have their input into uh, the deliberations that were going to follow. We met on September 8th, September 21st, October 19th, November 9th, and finally on December 16th, on the last page of this packet, you will see the mayor had a board briefing, and we call it a board briefing because we wanted the board members of the various associations to attend, and we also opened it up to anyone who was interested in the whole process of access management. So at the chamber on the 16th at nine in the morning, uh, we had this particular board briefing and opened it to, uh, to the, the general public. We also had all of our members of the team that was there, that were there, and uh, we had about an hour meeting, and we came out of that feeling comfortable that um, we had met our objectives. The individuals who were at that meeting had some questions about it, uh, gave us an opportunity to further deliberate about how we were gonna work it through uh, city law. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to respond to them, but that gives you the, the uh, timeline and how we put that process together. Questions for Fred? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and since you've heard that I like uh, slideshows, I'm gonna, gonna show you a quick one. Um, <coughs> starting with uh, why did we need this access management policy? Well, you kind of heard Rick talk a little bit about it, but a couple other things that go along with that. As we were putting together the comprehensive plan this year, we found out that we don't have enough money to pay for all the roads that we're gonna need in the future. So as a result of that, what we need to do is make sure that the roads we've got continue to function properly so that we can move traffic quickly and safely um, up and down our streets. Safety is another big, access, big uh, emphasis of this access manual. What we need to do is make sure that any time that uh, we're putting in new accesses that they're gonna be safe and so that uh, we're not creating places where we're gonna have more crashes out there. And finally, economic vitality was an important part of this. Um, as you heard, um, in order to, you know, from my standpoint, I'd like to see no driveways, but then we have no businesses. So, um, you know, traffic moves really well when there's no driveways, but businesses don't like that. So we had to have sort of a, uh, a compromise there in, in how we made that work. So why do we need this policy? As you heard Rick say, if you follow it to the T, you get the automatic yes. You, you move right through the process. Um, 
An another thing that, uh, that we wanted to do with this was to clarify some of the things that weren't really spelled out that well in the existing driveway standards. Um, we had a lot of things that said up to the discretion of the public works director. Well, you know, I think that generally works fine, but somebody coming in from the outside world that doesn't really know how things work here in the city of Lincoln, they prefer to have a little more specificity in this, and so this, uh, this new policy does provide that. And then finally, um, the old policy that we were working under didn't really identify the fact that, like in the built environment or for redevelopment cases, that, that we needed to look at those um, on a case-by-case -case basis. It was pretty much one size fits all, and so one of the things that we did right into this policy is, is more of a, a flexibility to, to look at things differently in, in the built environment. I guess the big thing about access management, we, we've got a different hierarchy of streets. We've got those streets that are, are there just to move traffic primarily, and we've got those streets down at the bottom of this list that are there primarily to provide access to homes or, or businesses. And then we've kind of got a mixture in between. And so what we wanted to do with this, this policy was to make sure that, that we were appropriately um, applying these standards to the various types of streets. This, this uh, map right here shows you basically the categories from that previous street and, or I'm sorry, the previous slide. Um, what you'll see there is, is the, I'll, I'll have you focus right now on the red streets. And those are the major arterials. Typically, we'd like to see the major arterials every two to three miles um, in a grid throughout the town. And you'll notice other than O Street, we don't really have much through the heart of town. And basically what that is, that's, that's recognizing the fact that all these areas are currently built out and it's just not going to be possible to, to get that high level of access control on those. And so, again, this was kind of um, looking at the fact that we need to be realistic. We need to take into account the build environment and, and bring our standards down accordingly. So what's new in this policy? Um, we've got new access spacing requirements, um, quite a bit different from what the old driveway standards would have had. Um, we have gone ahead and spelled out specifically when turn lanes will be required uh, for different uh, types of developments and also um, the lengths those turn lanes need to be. We added uh, throat length requirements and a throat length is basically the distance from the edge of the street until you meet the first point inside a parking lot where you've either got cars that are parking or unparking or cross access easements. Uh, another thing that we added into this was on-site storage requirements. Actually, we had those previously, but what we did was we went out to actual locations around Lincoln and counted cars, how many are stacking up at those maximum times, and tried to make those uh, more Lincoln-specific rather than the old uh, just standard numbers that we were using from around the country. We included a section on traffic impact studies um, to help people know ahead of time what it is we'll be expecting from them when we will be expecting them to do traffic studies and, and again, just trying to help them as they come in so that they can go through the process a little bit more um, efficiently. And then finally, uh, we went through a, a, a section on deviation procedures. And basically what we ended up with deviation procedures, this was probably the one that took the longest in the, in the committee that you heard about, was um, Ultimately, if, if someone does not like the answer that they get from the staff, they can appeal that to the Director of Public Works. If they don't like the answer that they get from the Director of Public Works, then they have the ability to appeal that to the City Council. And basically, once the City Council makes a ruling on this, that is the final ruling. There is no appeal to the Mayor on that. The road to adoption has been long and hopefully we're right here near the end of it. Um, as, as you kind of heard, we, we did start out with a professional technical and legal review. Um, the policy was sent out to a number of different engineering firms around town, those that um, just practice uh, transportation engineering as well as those that do a lot of development work so we could get both perspectives on it. Um, we ran it by the Nebraska Department of Roads, the Federal Highway Administration to get their take on it. We ran it through our law department to make sure that we didn't have anything that we we're going to run into trouble on. And then once we did that, we did put the, the draft policy on the web um, and ask for public review, and we did get a few comments back on that. Um, as you heard Fred say, I, I went out on the, uh, on the tour and took this out and showed it to anybody that would listen to me. And 
and uh, did get some good comments back from that that kind of started us down the road that, that we ultimately kind of finished up on. And then um, the study group that you heard Fred talking about um, was, I think, a very valuable exercise that we mm -hmm. went through. Um, again, it was good for them to rein me in as opposed to just letting me uh, impose the standards that I would have liked to have. So, um, and then finally, we uh, last month, we went through the Planning Commission and got their approval to, um, actually what they approved was to get rid of the old driveway standards um, in recognition of you adopting this as the new um, driveway standard for the city. And with that, I am done with mine. Dan. Would you explain that storage facility thing again? Yeah, I didn't understand I'm sorry. that at yeah. all. Yeah, um, basically what that is is like drive through banks or uh, drive through restaurants, those types of things, um, car washes, where you've got cars that stack up um, waiting to waiting their turn to access services, and so that's that's what that's about. I get it. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Randy? Okay. Thank you, sir. Who's up next? Oh, sorry. I apparently am off the agenda. This will be easy. Okay. <laughs> Council members, my name is Margaret Blatchford. I'm with the City Law Department. I am here to just basically tell you that obviously you have an ordinance in front of you, two resolutions. Um, what we would like to do and ask is that after your public hearing today, we have a holiday next week. So um, to lay over both the ordinance and the resolution till the 27th to vote so that you can vote on all three matters at the same time. Okay. Okay. Questions? All right. Thank you. Now, gentlemen. Uh, members of the council, my name is Tom Houston. My name is Peter Cat. You finished with three attorneys. What a bang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple comments about my participation, I guess our participation in this process this past fall. I was not concerning myself because myself because it's not within my area of expertise on throat widths or stacking requirements. I was more concerned about the process and the process how to get to yes for the built environment primarily because I think the committee was uniformly behind the fact that with these design standards, if you know what the rules of the game are with a fresh site, yeah, you can comply with them. I mean, that's possible. You can have the engineering done and, and you can make, the, make sure that you comply in most circumstances. But we were mo more concerned about the built environment and what we do, especially in light of the fact that the uh, 2040 comprehensive plan focuses on redevelopment and increasing density and making good use of our existing infrastructure. So we have to make some good compromises there. In, in my mind, that this policy does, it's kind of a three-step process. I think the first, pro first step in the process, it does require public works to use a common sense approach in the case-by-case -case analysis for the built environment. And I think that's step number one. Step number two then does provide the appeal rights to the director of public works with that deviation process. And that deviation was done intentionally to remove, the, the original language was really a variance, which in the legal context has a presumption against the property owner, and we want to make sure we got rid of that. So we focused on a deviation concept that there is no presumption against the property owner, that it really is based upon the facts and circumstances involved. And then ultimately the third approach in that process would be a ultimate appeals to the city council, which we think hopefully this process will diminish and decrease the amount of appeals to the city council out of this, <clears throat> out of these uh, kinds of disputes. So uh, I was encouraged by the process. I thought it was everyone came to the table with the idea of uh, making a policy that we could all live with and that would work well for the city in, for years to come. I would echo what, what Tom said. It was a very good process. No one on the committee spent any real time dealing with the standards. We think they're good standards to apply. The question, though, is, is that, and, and why Tom and I always get involved on this and why we care, is because you have to apply those standards in the real world. And that's where there's been a lot of time and energy and effort over the years, <clears throat> both with city staff, our time, uh, council's time, mayor's time, on balancing those issues on what good access management standards are with how it works in the real world. And um, it, it was encouraging. Tom and I were back there listening to Randy today, and we <laughs> liked what we heard because he was talking about the need to recognize that businesses need a drive, uh, driveway in order to do business in town. And, yeah, it won't get the cars past it quite as quickly, but there are other values in our community that we have other than just 
other than just moving cars fast through our town. And that was really brought home, I think, in particular with this update in the comprehensive plan this year, in which we've made a conscious commitment to redevelop and use the existing environment. And there are a lot of challenges in applying good access management policy. So <clears throat> Tom and I are convinced that we have a good policy within which we can work. We think it is likely that the number of times that council will need to weigh in on these will be diminished. And obviously the issue will be, will, will it work? Will it work how we think it is? And, and what the committee agreed to was that we agreed we've got a good product to work with. We can probably tell you right now that we didn't get it all right, um, but that we're committed to improving and working with this policy to balance uh, access management with other needs in the community. So I would encourage you to pass this after your two-week holiday. I think it uh, uh, is a good step forward with access management in the city. Questions for Tom or Peter? Carl. Yes, uh, Tom and Peter, thank you both for participating in this process. Um, if I understand it, it's, it's helpful in a couple different ways. Uh, it provides uh, guidelines for new development, so it's clear up front, quick, get that done, you, you know what you're dealing with. On the other hand, for the existing areas, for uh, the built environment, it, it provides the process for some flexibility and being able to, to work with what we've got and, and to make, uh, make adjustments so that, to, that those kinds of developments are, are possible as well. That, that, right? That's correct, and I, I think one of, the, one of the comments that we heard from staff, and, and we'd hear them you know, on other times, was who, who, who made us God? How do we get to change the standards? What's the purpose of that? And so I think that your staff appreciates the fact that this is a conscious recognition by council and others that, yes, there are standards, but there are other things that are of importance, too, and they get to engage their mind, use some common sense, and not simply apply access management standards to the detriment of all the other city policy standards. Yeah. So I, I think that they welcome having some additional direction on that, on being able to do that. Um, but you, you can ask them. But I think that was what I heard as a part of, you heard we had, we spent a lot of time together. Yeah. Well, I guess the other thing I would add is that in this process and review by Public Works, we now, in the built environment, there are a lot of situations where we're not going to be able to comply with these requirements, but we can improve the situation, and that was focused on, that we can improve the situation from a design perspective, okay. even though we can't achieve 100% compliance with the standards. And, and that was really the standard. If, if, if you're in the built environment, do no harm. Try to improve. Do your best. Improve. Don't make it worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we all heard you You promise, I believe, that, that we would see fewer of these. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I, 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 I described three steps in the process. As long as steps one and two uh, work out rationally, I think you should see Excellent. less in the step three. <laughs> which which <laughs> means less work for you two gentlemen, but uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, less work in this area would be welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you both gentlemen for being Thank participating. You. Anyone else? Any sum summation? Great. Nope. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak to these three items? Okay, Joan. 18 and 19. Amending chapters 1006 and 1044 of the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to automobile impoundment by amending the section relating to parking services, relating to payment of fines and costs, relating to mailing notice of complaint, relating to immobilization of vehicles, and relating to accounting for fees. And Approving an immobilization release fee of $50 for the release of a vehicle immobilized by the city pursuant to LMC section 1044035. Members of the Council, David Landis, Urban Development Department. Here in my capacity as the head of the department, charged with the responsibility for parking management. Um, we currently hand out a rather large number of parking tickets in this town for one reason or another. Um, not an extraordinary number by comparison to other communities and certainly not an extraordinary number compared to our past, but it is in the tens of thousands 
that we do this. And we're grateful for the compliance that we get. Um, in fact, we think that we're getting a little bit better compliance now that we have m made a difference um, between paying early and paying late. Um, however, we do have a number of people at any given time who have amassed a number of parking tickets. Um, if, you were to, if we were to look at the number of people who have five parking tickets or more, we'd find that that number is over 200. Um, now, last year we did tow people who were, I think we can use the word scofflaw, and that total number of towings was 385. Now these are not just, these, what these are not are snow bands. These are not people parking in um, a handicap zone. Those are people that are blocking and making a road unsafe. Those would be continued to be towed as they are now. But for people who are in a location, um, doesn't have to be a parking meter, can be on the parking public streets, um, in fact, can be on private property, but if we become aware of them, we would like to have a tool other than towing. And the reason is, and I know this from personal experience, <laughs> when you have your car towed and you return to that location and find your car gone, you do not know if your car's been stolen or if it's been towed. Um, so we would like to substitute or at least add to our, our, our range of opportunities the ability to boot or immobilize. These are not expensive machines to have. Um, they're pretty simple to operate. They're very, very colorful, usually in a bright orange. Uh, they do immobilize a car. And if you try to drive away with the car, you will do damage to the car, which is why prominently on the driver's side, we would put a notice like this that says we've booted your car. And the virtue of it is you know immediately where the car is and you have access to assistance in what it will take to unboot the car. And here's what you do. You got to pay your tickets. You got to get online and do it by computer, which you can do. Or you got to go to the parking offices there in the Haymarket garage. Got to pay your tickets. When we know that that's the case, we will send out our staff up until 10 o'clock at night, unlock the boot, take it off, you get your car, you go home. We're going to charge the same administrative fee that there is when the city has a car that we tow. We're collecting that now, but the tow fee is on addition to that. There is no tow fee, there's an administrative cost. So the tow fee of $53 or the potential storage fee after um, those fees wouldn't attach the person immobilized pays a $50 administration fee and their tickets and that's it. So it is in a sense quite likely cheaper this way. Secondly, it has an immediacy to it in which we can, if you pay your tickets, we can get out in 20 minutes, I'm going to guess, and unlock that boot, take it off, you can get in your car and drive home. What you got to do is pay your tickets. So um, we think that uh, avoid some confusion. And remember, the person who's had their car towed has this logistical problem. They've got to get their parking tickets paid. Then they've got to go out to the tow lot and pick up their car. All the time not having their car because it's been towed. They've got to get a taxi. They've got to get a friend. They've got to get somebody to drive them. They've got to get a second vehicle to go to the tow lot. If we immobilize at the location... They can walk to the city library and pay online. If they've got the right kind of a smartphone, they can do it on their phone. If they need to walk to, they can take their credit card or their cash, and they go and walk down to the address, pay it, and we'll meet them back at the car and unlock them. Not going to do it after 10 o'clock at night. Not going to sit there with somebody who's been in the bar <laughs> a long time, standing over somebody who's going to unboot their car. If you are out of the tow lot, the tow people are behind bulletproof glass in a, a, a room that's locked from the inside and the angry parker cannot get to the staff that is undoing the tow or letting them tow. So we will undo the tow. We'll do, undo the wood at 10 o'clock at night, but that's going to stop. 
They're going to next morning, we're going to start at 730. And you can't leave it there forever. If it's into the next day, then we will tow it. But to get this cheaper cost and this advantage of immediate behavior, immediate action, without having to go to the tow lot, we're going to, we're, when we catch a scoff lot, we'll do it in the morning, quite likely, into the middle of the afternoon, might go as late as the, the end of the parking meter time, which is 6 o'clock, although that's unlikely. But then at 10 o'clock at night, we're going to stop doing the unbooting. We'll pick it up the next morning. And that's what we'd like to be able to do. You have two pieces in front of you. One of them adds the word immobilization where the word towing occurs. We just did that wherever it was in the ordinances. We're not going to boot for things like snow emergencies. We're not going to boot when there's a car blocking a handicapped uh, 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 stall. We're going to tow those just like we do it now. But where we find somebody who's got five tickets or more, we'll put a boot on, and that's how we're going to get to the 200-plus people who are five tickets or more, up to, I think, 13 is about as high as we go. The second one is a resolution, and that's the one that creates the administrative fee of $50. Happy to answer questions for you. Jonathan? Uh, the 10 p.m. cutoff is an administrative choice. Yes. So you could, after reviewing how this works out, yes. make a decision to go later or cut it off earlier if you felt there was a safety issue. That's so. true. I'll tell you how we could handle the problem of somebody who shows up at 2 o'clock at night with a boot. When we actually don't want to put one of our modestly paid parking staff out there, not trained police, not part of that unit, okay, we don't want to put it in that context. If they call and say, well, you know, uh, I want my car tonight, we could do this. We could say, you know, if you want us to, we'll call and have the car towed right now. Pay your tickets and do exactly what you'd have under the law today, and we'll have it towed tonight. So at the 2 o'clock in the morning, we could do that. Are you saying it would actually be towed, or that the tow truck would show up, but having discovered the tickets were paid, would release the boot and charge a fee for having shown up, but just trying to figure out how far you need to go with... You know, I've got a lot to get over until I get to that day, and right now, <laughs> Councilman, I'm not sure what we do. One of the things I don't want to say is, you can rely on us to do it one way and only one way, and this is how it's going to be, and it's going to, we're never going to change it. We're going to make this idea work. Sure. Our initial reaction from the Parking Advisory Council and from other places in which this is done is that the booting gives at least a knowledge to the parker where their car is and a chance, if they do the right thing, to get their car back from that location as quickly as possible. It is an, an increase in convenience uh, for a very inconvenient thing. It makes an inconvenience less inconvenient. How we're going to administer it, my guess is it'll take us a little while to figure that out. But the towing company is available at all hours, and you can pick up seven. your car at all 24 hours. 24-7, that's right. Mm -hmm. The $50 fee, why did you choose to make that a resolution rather than just putting in the ordinance, since we're amending the ordinance, and it has all the other fees and... Um, we fine. thought the resolution put it where it was this way uh, existed, and I'm... I'm not sure if it's in an ordinance or not, and I'm not sure why it was drafted that way. We went to the city law department and says, here's what we want, and they gave us back these, and there's our chief lawyer. Ah. Probably going to tell me. Rod Coach. Confer, city attorney. It's the same way that uh, the towing ordinance was. The towing ordinance said that it's established by uh, resolution, so we made the uh, immobilization be the same way okay so the fines for parking violations are all set in ordinance but these fees for these kinds of administrative things are set in resolution correct thank you john thank you um appreciate your presentation just to reconfirm you said there are really 200 potential clients out there who might receive a boot yes that's about the right number we've only added 60 people go onto that list and they come off that list as they pay Although, up until now, it's been a somewhat intransigent number because there's, at $10 a ticket in perpetuity, 
there's not a great deal of incentive to pay these tickets, and they have collected, and they just try to run the risk of not being towed. Now, the, the cost is higher as the longer you wait. Um, so the number of additions to that list we think has slowed down some. We can only find 62 that have been added since September. That's good. We're moving in the right direction. But, so that's about the situation. And I think at other meetings, too, you've talked about the fact you're not trying to tow people. You just want them to obey the law, pay their tickets. Um, we would so like not to tow or boot at all, ever, if people just did what the law required. That's the best. So with this uh, pool of 200 potential clients, over the course of a year, how many, and maybe you said this earlier and I just didn't catch it, but how many toes a year mm -hmm. would this replace? Last year, we had 380 toes that were like this. And that's because the revolving pool exactly. keeps Some people would go on, some, some people would be, we, we would tow them and they wouldn't reappear. They came off the list. But there were new people who got onto that list at any one time. But it's not like there's 382 at all, at all time, but, but a changing profile of people who are in that situation. And you're talking about as far as tickets, they could be parking tickets. That, they're basically an, a non-moving violation ticket. Is that correct? Just so that our viewers and all understand, That's it's not right. just doing parking meter. It, right. For example, you could get to a place that we'd be very concerned with, uh, uh, a, a parking ticket or two in a couple of handicapped zones. That can get up pretty significant. You could get up to the place where you're well over $100, $150, um, that that description would be three violations, but two hundred and twenty-five dollars uh, 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 of of obligation in that situation. So you're in, now, I thought earlier you said you'd continue towing on handicap. Maybe I'm if they're in a handicap zone, right, and we get a complaint about it, uh, on a, we will tow those in some cases. Oh. In other cases, we will issue a ticket. Um, you could be on private property, and we might not tow from that private property parking space, but we would give a ticket. Okay. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't tow off the Safeway handicapped stall. Okay. But we'd, we might tow off a city uh, handicap zone. I want to clarify that. Ah, well, in that Sorry. case, I've been, I look at some of my third base coach who does Thank this you. all the time. Ken Smith, parking manager. Our, our policies, what we're looking at, uh, would be uh, five tickets, five outstanding tickets, or $250 okay. or more. So that's what we'd be looking for on the street. And the handicap ones, that would be apply in that same situation. That person there was violating that code. It would be the same situation or the same code applied to that. So the lesser of five tickets could be like $50 in fines yeah, or five two or two fifty. Okay. How many boots are you anticipating purchasing? We have three boots we're testing right now. So we're just going to let staff work with them, see which one works best. And then I would guess we'd probably have anywhere from six to eight boots at any one time. So we're going to kind of play it by ear and see what we need. And these are technically owned by or legally owned by you, the parking enterprise yes. fund. Yes. And now curiosity, what's a boot cost? Um, we've gotten as cheap as 270 to upwards about 580. What so there's a difference. Unfortunately, the $280 one takes a longer time to put on. We want to be able to put that boot on, get in, out, and be done with it. So, okay. Mr. Landis was talking about this 2 p.m. time that you could call and have the boot removed. And I'm thinking, <clears throat> my question is leading to staffing that you have with the Parking Enterprise Fund and, let's say, your management offices and so forth. Uh, you've got two questions here, really. One is, or concerns, the time people can pay this. Now, if the library is open or if they do have the smartphone, they could pay it at any time of the day or night, essentially. Right. But let's say you get after 4.30, 5 o'clock when your office is closed. They don't have a smartphone. They can't get to a library or something. How do they pay? But you could, I mean, you're able to come and get the boot off by 10, but how would they pay? There is a phone number on the notice as well, which they can call into our office and take care of those. So you can pay by phone as well. Okay. Um, so that will take place up at, even after office hours. We close at 530 at our office on 9th and Q. Those phones roll over to our Q Place garage on 11th and Q, and those are 24-7 phones. 
And so so we, you do have someone staffed anyway. We, it's not like you're adding do. staff to accommodate this. Right, right. But remember that after 10 o'clock, we're not talking about somebody going unbooting. We do have somebody on the phones. That person can say, read me your credit card. Okay. You don't have a computer? I got a computer. What's your credit card? Boom, 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 that boom, person's boom, boom. there 24-7, so you're not increasing that cost. Right. And then they, if it's after 10, they just have to wait till 7.30 the next morning to have That's the correct. boot removed. And uh, on the removal of the boot, how, how difficult is it? I mean, could uh, it, it, the, I assume then the $580 ones can a, a pretty much any person? It's I, a, I'm just not saying illegally remove it, but just go out there so you don't have to get it's a, basically a gorilla to do it. A padlock which covers the assembly and then so just remove the padlock and the assembly and you unbolt the boot i suppose I, if you I, had an arc <laughs> welding outfit and you had a mask you might be able to get the boot off yourself but it'd be pretty obvious to the people downtown when they saw that blue light hit that metal that you were trying to you know get that boot off um what happens is the locking system also has a system that covers over it so you, it, it's really hard to get to until you can do the appropriate unlocking. Know, can it be defeated? I suppose it can be defeated, but you probably are risking your car itself to overcome the boot, and there just isn't a body of evidence that says that that's likely to happen. Will you, which are you going to primarily mount them on a certain tire out of, say, the four tires on a vehicle? It will be the driver's side front tire. So, yes. And then my last comment, this is really a comment, that really by having these and in that orange color, it's also sending a message to the public they can see. Oh, gee, Dave Landis got booted there, and uh, so I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm going to go That's pay right. my tickets. So yeah. hopefully get I appreciate the casting in that scenario to make me the person who is deserving of being You're booted. You're the nearest person other than my dear colleague. I have been <laughs> towed on in the past. It's true. Thank you. Yeah. There is a boot that covers the... I think my questions have been okay. answered. Okay. Uh, oh. Perhaps, except one, and that okay. is... Um, all these numbers that you're quoting about people being towed, are those all toes for violation of the law, tickets and so forth, or are there other things? There are toes that go on because people are where they shouldn't be. But they're toes oftentimes in private property. Um, there are toes because uh, you're, there are certain lanes of traffic in downtown Lincoln that we will tow on and certain lanes of traffic that we ticket on. And the suit is because we've decided we really need to have those lanes of traffic open. Um, and, and that can occur. Thank you. Oh, Carl. OK. Um, thank you. As a as, uh, person, as a downtown resident, see these kinds of issues uh, on, on occasion. Um, the 10 o'clock hour concerned me a little bit, but as I think about it, it's um, it's not a one-time incident. It's it's you know it's, you've you've built up some some history here. Uh, I guess what I would think about what would concern me would be somebody comes here from you know Omaha or some other city and they get a parking ticket and they're booted and they're at the lead center and they're stuck for the night. Uh, but it, that's that's not a likely situation. I think as we're talking about this, I'm also thinking about the alternative. And, and uh, a $50 boot fee is considerably less than 125 or whatever the current going rate is for the towing fee. So uh, I think that's important for people to understand that, that this is actually uh, a lesser uh, <laughs> hit than what they might otherwise experience. We don't want to be heavy-handed here. We're not trying to trap people or catch people for making a modest error of staying 15 minutes longer in a parking stall than they should. Yeah. Um, in fact, this council has reduced the cost of that. Our rule was $10. It's now $9 if you pay online in the first day. If you, We found a way to make it less expensive for people to make that error. That's true. Um, than it used to be. Now, we've made it more costly to be dilatory mm -hmm. in answering your responsibilities. But, for example, out-of-town guests, we give them courtesy tickets. We let them, we, rather than paying the ticket and then forgiving it, we tell them, look, we forgave this ticket. We're glad you come, came. Remember, next time you need to pay your parking meters. But that's much more of what we want to have happen. We want people to believe that there's available parking, that we welcome them, and that we will show forbearance, but only so far. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? 
Does the fifty dollars cover your costs? How did you arrive at that number? We we arrived at it because it was the city's administration fee for towing. We created uh, essentially the same cost. Okay, but you feel it will cover the extra cost? I mean, that goes into the parking enterprise fund. No, it no. does not. It goes to the general fund. It's associated with the right. tow fee. It's the same thing. It's either one or the other. It's not cumulative. We, we didn't want to create a situation in which it was general fund if it was one, but the parking fund yeah. if it was the other. And so we treated it like the general fund with the same cost recovery price <clears throat> to that. Um, uh, so that's how we arrived at the $50. So your employees, though, are, who go out and put on the boots are working for the parking enterprise fund. Yes, they are. So the payment to take the boot off goes to the general fund. How's the reimbursement made? Um, it'll wind up uh, being part of the cost of our contract with whoever we have as our parking management company, currently Republic. Um, these are people who are employed for that portion of time. We do not anticipate putting more people on. We intend to add this to the list of their duties. They will stop doing what they were doing with their time and go do this. But we don't envision adding a half-time person or a full-time person, in part because we don't think it'll happen all that often. Even if you were to spread 380 across a calendar, it would be one a day, yeah. two a day, if that was the case. So this isn't a big money maker for. Huh. We're not going to be able to retire on this money. No, there'll be no Cancun trip out of this. When tickets are issued, is the history for that particular? car available instantly to the person issuing the ticket so when they get to that point they say ah I've, they're coming across and another car that's at an expired meter they look at ah, 300 dollars worth of tickets that's when the call would go in to bring out the boot what the yes the information shows up on their handheld when they enter a plate information on the VIN number and it will show it will red flag the car the person on the street will call back to the office and see how many tickets are outstanding past 15 days. So those past 15 days are eligible for booting or towing. Okay. It won't be this ticket today. It'll be the accumulation of late tickets. Right. That's no, right. no, I understand that. It's just that would cause them to look it up. Yes. yes. And they would look it up on the spot for every car that they give a ticket to. And they've got a computer access to that. Do you ever give day. any other kinds of warnings or is the ticket sufficient? They know they have past due tickets. You never, don't ever put a note on the card that, with this ticket saying, by the way, one more, and you may find your car missing or booted. It will give you the boot. It will give you the boot. I'm yeah, I, I, just curious. I, I don't know if you have a mechanism for that or if, if for those who are paying little attention to their past due tickets, if they have any warning that they are have so many accumulated. Email, uh, a late uh, ticket notice mm. saying your ticket's overdue. Um, it's part of the added cost of why it's uh, the dilatory ticket payer adds to our expenses and costs because we do that. Is there a special notice that says, and this is your fifth or fourth? We haven't uh, put that in place at the moment. We haven't done that in the past. Would we consider it in the future? We might consider it in the future. That's an administrative change you can make. Exactly. You, We'd be free to do that. John? They can do that option now. They can go online, look up everything they have as well, and they can call the office any time. And then every week we're sending out notices to those that have tickets 15 days past. So they are getting notices on a regular basis, those that have. Every week you send out a notice. We're sending out new notices. There's new people. New notices. In yes. Right. So Once you've all... gotten your notice of past due, that's it. You don't yes. send reminders no. regularly. Unless they got another citation then they would get another one that come 15 days past okay yeah just a question geographically are you going to use these boots all over the city we would be legally entitled to do so um i'm as uh, in the event we've got uh, our public safety officers outside of the downtown who find a, a car for which this is susceptible and calls in the right data, um, we could apply the boot there. I think it actually would be wise to do it where we found offenders. 
so that we don't assume the only place where you're at risk is downtown. Go any place all you want to, and you can be a scofflaw and nothing will happen to you. But if you're downtown, the eyes out. I, th I think the better approach is to, if we find a scofflaw, that we respond any place in the city. I think you need to be non discriminatory. So you might let LPD have one of those boots. Thank you. <laughs> we might charge them for one of the boots. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? I would just say, I guess I'm the only person who watches Parking Wars on TV, so I, I see the booting all the time. Yeah. And it's very easy. Two minutes, the boot's on, two minutes, it's off. Uh, the question I have on the, the notice, if it's past 10 o'clock, 24 hours, the boot sits there, are you, so that people have the next day to pay their tickets, or what, is there going to be a specific time, the boots? I'll tell you what I, what I think the, the, the clock will be like, but I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy to tell the world, oh, you're safe, it's such and so. Our greatest likelihood of finding somebody and applying a boot is in the morning up until the early afternoon. I think it's much, more much less likely that we will use the boot late in the day. Um, uh, because, our, uh, for one thing, our tours of parking... Uh, spaces really dominate in the in, in the early hours, so I think that's what's likely to happen. Which means, I think the boot will be on there for a number of hours until ten o'clock at night. Um, I think you're gonna have a really good chance of coming out and finding that you got a boot while we're available and we can unboot and while they can get on the phone and these will be available. Um, we will not be putting on boots because we won't be catch I, that I can expect after six o'clock at night when the parking meter. F folks are done. There's little reason why we'd be out there. Might, but, but I don't think that's the case. So here's the clock that we would anticipate. I think the heavy morning you know, review of cars some, it starts to peter out in the middle of the day, less likely at the end of the day. 10 o'clock at night is the maximum when we're going to be able to do this. They've got the towing phenomenon overnight. Next morning, we come back to work at 7.30. Everybody ought to be sober by then. And between 7.30 and 10, we'd be happy to do this work. But at some point, when they've been there for like 20, you know, 24 hours, then we will tow the car and have the car towed. And I know like the city of Philadelphia, it's two hours. The boot's on there for two hours, and then they tow it after that. So they don't give We're you gonna much We're going to give them a good deal longer than yeah, Philadelphia. We're a, even though this, that's the city of brotherly love, <laughs> we're going to be about 10 times more flexible than the city of brotherly love. And, that, and the, the, the question, can, if the tow truck is called, but then at that time they'd be able to unlock the boot, or do we have to call one of the parking service people too? We could provide the uh, tow company the keys to get to the boots the off boot. as well. Yeah. Okay. And then, as Mr. Camp said, if we took a look, as they say on TV, the top big hitters of the list, mm -hmm. uh, the top 10 or 25, wh why can't we go search out those people? We, we know can. where they live we and can. put a boot on their car? We could. Okay. Mm. No <laughs> if they're on a public street, <laughs> then we can boot their car. <laughs> okay. I, 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 the reason is I, I had a conversation. It was a third-handed conversation, but it was. If it is visible... You, the city is able to um, uh, exercise discipline about a vehicle of one kind or another um, on private property. I don't think we have a history of doing that. No. But the extent of our legal authority apparently extends to that. Okay. It's not like a King's X. I'm in public property. Okay. Now I'm at risk. I'm in private property. Can't catch me. Mm, no, not so much. Okay. Well, if, if I may, we don't want to harass our citizens. But That's right. We're looking at violators. We just want compliance with the law. We laws. want compliance. You know, perhaps one way to solve the situation would be, I don't know, at least to think about some sporadic situation where you might check with the address of somebody, and that way it's like people realize we got to pay these bills, or we don't, or just don't violate. You know, it's possible. I'm not saying that we will, but I think it's a reasonable thing when you've got a new situation like this. <laughs> There's a couple hundred people out there that might want to get a letter from us saying, you know, we've changed our policy and here's what it is. And, you know, there's a way to avoid this whole mess. Pay your, Pay your tickets. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Any yeah. other questions? Just having the publicity of this coming up, I'm sure we'll see a rush of payments on some of these late notices. So you'll probably see those as well. We hope so. Thank you, yes. gentlemen. Anyone, anyone else wishing to speak to these two items? Okay. Thank you, Joe. Hearing resolutions, item 20. Approving a contract agreement between the City of Lincoln and Windstream for upgrade of 911 telephone system mm -hmm. maintenance pursuant to bid number 11146 for a 60 month term. Good evening. Vince Major, City of Pertstein, here to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Vince on this item. <clears throat> Thank you for staying, Vince. I don't see any. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Okay. Item 21, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and improving disposition of claims set forth for the period of January 16 to 31. Anyone wishing to speak to the claims item? I don't see anybody. Do we can move on? Okay, that concludes the public hearing portion of the meeting. Shall we go into the voting session? Yes, and I think first thing we do is uh, extend the uh, public hearing on two items which are what, 10 and 11? I thought we did that when we were. Just or 10 and 11, it, yeah. Okay. I think we're there now. But uh, we're almost we are, there. Uh, Not yet. Liquor first, yeah. Yeah, do liquor oh, first. I, I move approval of the liquor license to uh, both items 7 and 8. 7 and 8, can Second. Second by Carl. Okay. okay. Call the roll on that. Bridge? Yes. Shimmick? Yes. Cam? Yes. Carol? Yes. Cook? Yes. Emery. Yes. Motion carried six to zero. May did. I pick up item yeah. number one under yeah. consent? I'm sorry. I wanted to buy that. Yes, go ahead. Resolution number one was introduced by Camp. So moved. Okay. Second by Doug. Thank you. Okay. Call it call roll. Eskridge? Yes. Shimmick? Yes. Camp. Yes. Carol. Yes. Cook. Yes. Emery. Yes. Motion <coughs> carried six to zero. Okay, then eleven and twelve. Okay. Or ten and eleven. Actually, yes, I move that we continue the public hearing with action for items 10 and 11 on February 27th. Do you have a second? Second. Second by Doug. And, Discussion? And I was willing to, to delay longer. It sounds like there may be enough time for these neighbors to, to meet. If we don't see a resolution in two weeks, we might need to give it a little more time. We'll just see how that works out. Okay. And discussion? Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Shimmick? Yes. Camp? Yes. Carol? Yes. Cook? Yes. Emory? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Okay, then the remainder of those items under second reading, items nine uh, through 19, excluding 10 and 11, then are having their second reading in addition to 10 and 11. Public hearing resolutions, item 20, approving a contract agreement between City of Lincoln and Windstream, introduced by Shimmick. So moved. Second. Second by Doug. Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Shimmick? Yes. Camp? Yes. Carroll? Yes. Cook? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 21 is the report of new and pending claims introduced by Shimmick. I move it. Second. Second by Doug. Discussion? Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Shimmick? Yes. Camp? Yes. Carroll? Yes. Cook? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Uh, for the record, public hearing liquor or ordinances first reading none. Ordinances third reading item 22 is amending title 20 of the code by adding a new chapter 2012 to adopt the 2009 edition of the International Residential Code. This was introduced by Hornig. So, did someone wish to move this so one? So moved. Okay. Second. Second by Doug. Discussion? John. Well, I. Uh, have gone back and forth on this question about these ice shields that are being mandated under this. And uh, I think I've come to the conclusion I'd like to see it uh, discretionary. And so I'm not sure what would be the appropriate amendment, but just to say that on uh, existing homes that strongly encouraged or to, to put in the ice shield. Do you want to make that amendment? I would make that motion. Motion to amend. Second. Okay. Okay. And again, just to elaborate a little bit, I've had a roofers call and we're other citizens, and and I'm hearing them talk a little bit more, elaborating what we heard in the public hearing on the need. Uh, can, it can be abated by having correct insulation and better um, ventilation, but that there's not necessarily a, a one fix cures all type thing, and that 
you need a little discretion there and that way it might be better spent for our homeowners to uh, apply the cost uh, instead of doing the sheet so if it doesn't solve the problem and it's not needed to me I, it's difficult for me to mandate it to somebody um, I think um, much like uh, when you go out and buy a car you have choices um, I would hope that the the um, uh, the roofer is offering choices um, and I think there is some incumbent on the uh, person making the purchase um, to ask questions and make sure that they're getting what they desire so I will support the motion Jonathan well, and I was uh, called by a roofer who thinks this is a very important thing to add into the code it is a pretty standard code item uh, throughout the country, throughout northern climates, um, uh, this would this I see as a, a very basic kind of protection. We, unlike a lot of elements of our code, which are about improving energy efficiency, let's say adding more insulation, but they don't really go to safety. They don't stop water. That's that's not what they're about. They're just about making for a more efficient home. This is actually about water infiltration. This is about preventing water from getting in and doing damage inside. This is about uh, preventing mold. Um, I see it in the same category as I see like the house wrap and other requirements that didn't used to be in place years ago in homes, but are now standard practice and are required by codes uh, most places. So I think it fits into that category, and I think it is important to, to home buyers down the road that even you can ask questions, but if you find out it's not there, it's still hard to go retrofit the roof. Um, and as we see temperatures like we've had this week, which are often just below freezing, there's enough hot air from inside a home that it may melt and then refreeze as it gets to the edge uh, to the eve. Um, and uh, that's, that's when the problems occur. So uh, I think it's, it's an appropriate